Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. It's a webinar which is the first of a series towards the National Borderline Personality Disorder Training and Professional Development Strategy. My name is Lynn O'Grady and I'm a community psychologist and I work typically with the Australian Psychological Society but facilitate some of these webinars for NHPN and really enjoy the opportunity and welcome you and, and our panel for this evening's webinar. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land and on behalf of MHPN and Spectrum and the Australian BPD Foundation Limited acknowledge um, the traditional custodians wherever we are around, around the country and um, pay respects to Elders past, present and future for memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I um, work with the Australian Psychological Society managing some projects and um, have been managing the Kids Matter project most recently. And I'm really pleased tonight to be able to facilitate this, this session and, and to have a panel of, of experts who are, who are really specialists in the borderline personality disorder area with lots of experience and, um, and work in that space as well as an advocate who's joining us as well. So hopefully you've had a chance to have a look at their bios and also have a look at the case study so that you've got a chance of um, kind of really keeping up with the conversation tonight and, and knowing that's what we're, we're aiming, aiming to be doing. Uh, as I said, this is the first of a, a series of webinars and the funding is coming through the Australian Government and other webinars in this series which will be happening early next year are listed here. So you can see that there's, there's a series of, of six. So there's lots of content to cover in this area and tonight is, is really a starting point and, a, and an overview and we're going to give you lots and lots of information but you can see there that there's going to be a lot of, lot of other topics that will be covered and a lot of other information that will be shared in, in coming months. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for those as well. We have lots and lots of interest in this webinar and we have many people who are joining us and many people who will be watching this later as a podcast on, on various websites where they're available. We're also mindful that um, this topic, as many of the mental health topics that, that we do deal with, can be quite tricky sometimes and be quite, it can be quite hard for people to, to hear the symptoms and signs and, and can be really um, find it quite triggering at times. And we know that we'll have some people who, um, who are, do have their own experiences, lived experience borderline personality disorder or are caring for people with um, borderline personality disorder. So we're really wanting to make sure people are very mindful of that, are able to look after themselves, have a bit of a plan for yourself and that might mean that you're not necessarily going to watch the whole webinar tonight. You can watch it as far as you, you feel like you're comfortable doing and then you can, you'll get a record and you can look at it later if, if you want to do that as well. Or other strategies that, that you know work for you and that might mean people that you, you talk to or your own self-care plan that, that you have in place. So I really wanted to, I guess, remind people about the importance of that and, and, um, and really get you thinking about that right from the start. Now I did mention the panel and then I skipped over them. This is a panel that, um, that I think is going to bring us a whole lot of information. As always, they come from a range of different discipline groups and bring a range of experience with them. I'm going to hear from, from each of them in a moment, so I'm very pleased to, to have them as part of this. Uh, the way that we work in these webinars is that we all hear from them each. Uh, we'll do a presentation and then we'll actually have some time for, for question and answer and that's where we would like you to participate um, in, in whatever way you can. Uh, we have a question and answer um, session rather than a panel chat this evening and we have lots of questions that have already been sent through. So we're doing our best to answer those in the presentations and to build those into our question and answer planning. So we're hoping we'll get to answer lots of those questions. We'll also have some resources that will be available for you later on um, the Spectrum website. And of course we've got the, the whole series where lots of the questions that we don't get to tonight can be picked up and answered there as well. All right, so you've had the, you've had the bios already and um, we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the sort of process that we're going to be going through and really wanting to make sure that if you need technical support that you can use the, um, the tab that's marked as technical support. We have Redback Help Desk phone number there as well. So if you're really um, struggling with the technical side of that, there's good support for you. We have people moderating, so if you do put some questions in the, the Q&A, there might be some people who answer you there as well, but I'll keep an eye on that as well. So that's our, that's our housekeeping and our, um, our way that we're going to be working together. You would have read the case study and in, in registering you're probably very familiar with the learning outcomes of what we, we're aiming to achieve in this webinar 
And because it is the first one, we're really looking at what are we talking about when we're talking about borderline personality disorder underlying causes. We're looking at the um, diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and what that might mean in terms of the discussion with, with patients, clients and families. And then really looking at some of the, I guess, some of the past understandings and ways that people have, have been thinking about borderline personality disorder as well. So I'm going to introduce each of the panellists to start with and then we're going to jump into Joe's um, presentation first off. So I've got a question for each of them. We're going to put them to work very, very quickly because we do have so many questions that we're, we're wanting to answer. So I'd like to introduce um, Associate Professor Josephine Beetson. Jo is a psychiatrist and does some work with, with Spectrum. And welcome Jo and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. And thank I've got a question for you straight away. What age can we now diagnose borderline personality disorder? Well, very young. Now we can diagnose it legitimately in adolescence. Even from some people say 12, most people would suggest 14. Mm -hmm. If all the features of BPD are there, it is diagnosable in adolescence. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's quite a change to in the, in the past, perhaps, where people well, had to wait until they were... Well, it, it was... A, it, well, that's true, but also people didn't like to diagnose it in adolescence because mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, worry that they were then labelled. But mm -hmm. the modern thinking is that it's actually better to diagnose features are there and get on to treatment straight yep. away. Okay. So Much really better treatment. outcomes when that happens. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing some more for you in a moment. Sure. Next in line is Dr. Christopher Worm and, and Chris is a general practitioner and has also done some other, other um, studies and has an interest in alcohol and other drug dependency. So Chris, again, putting you on the, on the spot straight away. Welcome. And can you tell us a little bit about your interest in borderline personality disorder, please? Yeah, I um, particularly like the uh, the approach that Professor Viktor Frankl developed. So he, he was a, an Austrian psychiatrist, wrote books, in, including one called Man's Search for Meaning. And as I got more and more interested in, you know, what, what it's like for people who are looking for meaning and purpose in their lives, uh, for, for borderline for, BPD to have uh, feelings of emptiness as one of the, the characteristic symptoms uh, seemed to uh, to be a particularly good match. And I suppose as I as I talk to people and and you know I was curious and uh, I might not have known exactly what to do, but I, I think people appreciated that you know, I, I showed some level of interest. And um, yeah, it seems to be a a reasonably big part of the work I do, uh, which probably is not absolutely typical regular general practice work these days. Mm. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And again, looking forward to your, your perspectives from a, a GP. It's always important that we have a GP because often GPs are the first port of call for people when they're, they're looking at what's happening. So we'll be interested to, to hear from you as well. So thank you. And now to, to Jan. Jan McMahon, OAM, is our advocate for our panel this evening. So Jan, again, welcome and thank you for, for being here with us. And another question, throwing you in as well. Um, so your question to start with, post-diagnosis, some people find it difficult to remain positive about their future. What would be your message? What would you say to people who might be a bit concerned about it? Yes, look, very quickly, uh, people can and do recover. Uh, there's a great deal of hope um, with the BPD diagnosis these days, particularly the different uh, evidence-based treatments that are now on offer. So I think there's a great deal of hope. Fantastic. Thank you. A really important starting point for us, I think, tonight as we're, as we're exploring this to, I guess, to be really thinking about hopeful messages and, and perhaps how things are, are being seen these days, which might be important for people. So thank you and looking forward to you as, as your presentation as well. And last on our panel tonight, but not least by any means, is Julian Brown. And Julian, you're a psychologist and you've been doing some work with Spectrum for, for a while now. So thank you for joining us. And a question for you is, can a psychologist diagnose borderline personality disorder? Oh, yeah. Hi, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, look, absolutely. Um, it's part of a psychologist's role uh, to diagnose, of course. One has to be uh, careful and thoughtful with regards to diagnosis and the meaning that that might hold for a particular client. 
and so it's important to be sensitive about that, but also very clear. Um, a, a nice um, way of managing that is to is to really share the, um, the criteria with the client and ask the client, is, is this uh, these symptoms that you experience? And so the client might at times identify with that and that might assist in the diagnosis. Yeah, okay. So starting with the client first, of making sense rather than mm. the other way around. Okay, fantastic. So, so that's just given everybody a little bit of a taste, I guess, of, of the sorts of things we're going to be talking about and the different, um, I guess, the different practitioner perspectives, but also really focusing, as we always do with MHP and webinars, on the connections and the collaboration that can happen between and, and I think the idea of working together as much as possible so that we, we're really getting the benefits for, for clients and patients. Now just a reminder as well for, for people who are perhaps familiar with our MHPN usual way of working is that we usually have a chat that's quite active and some people love it and some people don't. We've got lots and lots of numbers um, that are joining us this evening so we've actually changed that format. So if you're looking for it and wondering where it is or you're, you're really missing it, um, we don't actually have it tonight but we do have a question and answer so we can actually get any questions that you do have that you're really wanting, wanting to come through to us that will come through to the moderators and to myself. So we will monitor that. Uh, but we don't have the usual chat chat function. So if you're looking for that, it's it's not there for this evening. Um, let's move into our presentation. So our case study, hopefully you have had a chance to, to talk about and we'll be giving um, opportunity for sort of info, general information but also tapping into the case study. So when people are um, joining us, sometimes they're thinking about their own cases or themselves but we really like to have a case study that we can, we can draw upon and really have this, this kind of made up example that we can, that we can really talk about in a, in a really appropriate way. So you'll see the presenters will be coming in about general information but then also touching on the case study and, and hopefully you have, have had a chance to read it. It's about Rachel. Um, is a case study who has a, 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 a quite a detailed list of um, things that have happened over the course of her her life that, that is suggestive of um, borderline personality disorder, and that's what we'll be sort of referring to. So hopefully you can access that and, and you've had a chance to, to read it. But that's what we'll be we'll be doing. All right, I think it's time to to hear from the panel. So let's begin with you, Joe, and you're going to give us a bit of an overview of what borderline personality disorder is. So thanks. Ben, thank you. Good to be here. Um, what is first borderline personality disorder? It's a serious mental illness with the following core features. Difficulty regulating, controlling emotions and impulses, unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, an unstable self-image or sense of one's own identity, and also going along with that, an unstable sense of the identity of others. Importantly, in addition, an insecure attachment to significant others. Suicidal and self-injurious behaviours often occur at times of stress in particular, but they tend to remit within a year or two of effective treatment, and that's a terribly important recognition. The prevalence of borderline personality disorder is 1 to 4 percent in the community. It's up to 30 percent, however, of psychiatric inpatients and 15 to 23 percent of outpatients in psychiatric facilities. So we see how, how highly represented it is in psychiatric uh, services. What causes this serious illness? Well, very complex causation. It's the outcome, really, of an admixture of several things. One's inborn temperament, difficult childhood experiences, and insecure attachment. Some people, some many authorities, consider that insecure attachment can be used very effectively to explain all the phenomenology, in other words, all the symptoms, all the behaviours that occur with people with BPD. Now the inborn temperament in this disorder is usually oversensitive, anxious and has a preponderance of negative over positive emotions. However, my question about the preponderance of negative over positive emotions is how much is that an outcome of difficult very early childhood experiences because difficult 
infant experiences can result from parents' difficulties with soothing a very anxious, sensitive baby. Very hard for parents, very extremely much harder, of course, for the poor baby. But this is, this is a fact of, of uh, what happens between parents and mothers, in particular perhaps in babies. And uh, difficult experiences, feelings of invalidation, we don't like to call it that in infancy, but babies sense things very early and they will know if mother is, or father, anyway, the principal caregivers are actually not able to get them, if you, if you like, to tune in to what they're feeling and their distress and to help soothe it. Abusive experiences, of course, can also contribute, um, but they're likely to be much rarer in very early life. Now, the insecure attachment in borderline personality disorder manifests in adulthood in the severe anxiety about abandonment that is um, really almost inevitable in people with the illness. Childhood trauma or abuse is by no means always present. It, of course, is present at the time, but it's by no means, um, what's the word, always there. Now, when do you consider a diagnosis? When do we, when do I consider a diagnosis of BPD? Well, you look to the following. When there are frequent presentations to emergency departments, primary health services like GPs and so on, mental health services, with self-harming or suicidal behaviours, you need to think of BPD. That doesn't mean that BPD is necessary for diagnosis by any means. But if it's a frequent, repetitive presentation, you must think of it. Frequent presentations in crises with severe emotional distress, sadness, anger, unmanageable anxiety uh, in the context of, of a crisis is a very common um, marked and sign. Crises in particular tend to occur in interpersonal relations relational context, I'm getting my words mixed up, or when abandonment threatens. When someone has felt to be rejecting or highly critical uh, or invalidating, that sort of thing is likely to occur to um, trigger sometimes a sense of crisis and major, major distress. Frequent occurrence of dysregulated emotional states and or impulsive stress-related behaviours Again, consider this diagnosis. Um, now, if you think the diagnosis is actually present, you would only communicate it when you're sure. Don't communicate the, the possibility because that's not helpful at all. But when you're sure that this is probably what your patient has, uh, describe, as Julian was saying earlier, Describe it in terms that the patient has already talked to you about particular symptoms. Look, my mood's up and down all the time, and uh, when I want to self-harm, I just can't stop myself. It's the only way, blah, 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 of relieving stress. All that sort of thing. You use what the patient has actually told you. Then you name borderline personality disorder, and you say, is it treatable illness? It responds very well to treatment, and there are now very effective treatments available. Be absolutely sure to say that the internet is a, a, an unhelpful source of information. It's often misleading, it's often frankly inaccurate, and it's often grossly exaggerated. Give the patient a written account of BPD, or refer them to a reliable website the Borderline Personality Disorder Foundation has a very good website. So does Spectrum, and so does Project AIR in New South Wales. Worth asking your patient if they want to discuss the diagnosis with their partner or their family or their carer. And if they do, is there any help they'd like from you in doing this, what to say, and so on? All worth doing. Now, my next slide, I have, I'm having trouble with this thing, I'll just go down, 
is the treatment. Um, psychotherapy, either individual or group psychotherapy, is the principal form of treatment for BPD. Absolutely across the board is the principal form of treatment. However, if a patient is in crisis, uh, they're not going to be able to engage for a moment in psychotherapy. If a patient is in crisis, then you need to ensure safety and containment before you do anything else. How do you provide safety in a crisis? Well, in my view, safety in a crisis is best offered through developing with your patient a safety plan or a crisis plan, whichever you want to call it. And that involves what are they going to do to try and soothe themselves when they're distressed in a crisis situation? What have they found helpful in the past? And what do they tend to do to try and self-soothe? Write that down. It needs to be a written thing because uh, people in a crisis need something to look at. Sometimes they need something on their fridge to, to, to go to. You might, but then, important to also put down, if the distress is unmanageable and they've done all the things they have agreed to do, to try and manage the stress, then who do they contact? What do they do? Write the phone numbers in, write uh, the names of the people wherever possible, so that they have got something actually structured to do in a crisis. That's the very most important means of managing safety. Containment is a different kettle of fish, but hopefully achieves similar ends. Containment is helping the patient to deal with their own distress. You've already written down and discussed with them what they usually do in a crisis situation or when they're distressed to manage the distress. Yep, and you've written that down. But you want to help them with other strategies when their own have not been adequate. So you might go through the breathing techniques with them, deep breath in and a very slow breath out, distraction techniques, taking the dog for a walk, all, all things that they may not have come up with or even know about for themselves. And you can suggest, but always in a very uh, collaborative, cooperative way. Those are the best means of containment. And once a person is able to manage her distress, then different forms of psychotherapy, and I'm not going to go into all the different forms that are available, uh, can be introduced. Psychotherapy must be a collaborative endeavor with an active therapist. You know, you're active, you're in there, you're interested, you're curious, you want to understand. You want to understand what it's like for this person. Be respectful, be flexible, empathic. You, you, you're with them in their emotions. At the same time, you're able to step back in order to acknowledge and think about them. You're able to acknowledge your own mistakes, misunderstandings, we all make them, <laughs> sadly too often I sometimes think, in my case, and take responsibility for them. Validate their distress, always validate it, so important, because too often these people have not been validated or had their distress validated in childhood. Focus on their thoughts and their feelings especially at the time of self-harm or risk-taking behaviours, because you want them to become able to link feelings of emotional distress with the urge to self-harm. That linking of emotions and impulses is of profound importance to them becoming more able to resist impulses to action and focus on their own feelings. Consistent session times, duration, agreed goals, Clarity about the treatment approach and, as I've said, responses to crises are all critical to treatment outcomes. However, I want to stress this, the quality of the therapeutic relationship, the relationship, the connection, the emotional connection between you and the patient is the most important aspect of all treatment, not just psychotherapy, for BPD. Over back to you, Liz. Thanks, Joe. And what a what a fabulous overview, I think, for, for people and moving into what it is and, and treatment. And I, I think what I really appreciated was 
where your, your, your language was very respectful around uh, really appreciating what's going on for, for people who are coming to see you. So I think people would have really got, got a lot already of, out of that, that session um, that you've just, just been through. So, so thank you very much to you, Joe. And we're going to move on to, to Chris now, but we'll be back to you with some, some questions. I'm sure people want to just keep an eye on, on the questions as well. Um, if people have got any particular questions of Joe, you can feel free to use that Q&A function so that we can get those. So let's move on to you now, now Chris, and, and I know you've got some, um, some thoughts you're going to take us through in terms of perhaps the older ways and, and ways that people have perhaps talked about and understood borderline personality disorder in the past. So you're going to take us a little back, way back before we can come forward again. Okay. All right. Well, well certainly there, there was a time that um, BPD was um, a diagnosis that, that um, people were sometimes even reluctant to accept that that was the diagnosis because they, they may well genuinely have overheard people speaking without respect, without understanding. Uh, there was a time that um, BPD was seen to be, uh, well, all, all of the personality disorders were seen to be different from real illnesses. They were, you know, there was this sort of, the DSM had access one, access two, access three, and, and there were some areas where people would say, oh, we won't take on this client because Everything's access to. Um, that, that's that's not the way things are done now. Um, BPD is recognised as a genuine and specific uh, psychiatric illness and a very treatable one. So the outlook is much better now. And there are some really old definitions that we have to uh, completely um, consign to the history books. They were quite pessimistic. Uh, really, the treatment for BPD is is, is very good, and um, there are even some people who embarrass us clinicians by improving with little or no treatment. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to really highlight the, the good things in the present and not, uh, not be bogged down with things in the past. Um, now, if we're going to talk about how to approach getting to know Rachel, um, typically people often think, well, get, taking a history, you really need a lot of information, but exactly as Joe said, you really want a good therapeutic relationship and even in general practice where you're not necessarily all setting out to be therapists, uh, it's still good if you can bear in mind that what you really want is rapport, a therapeutic alliance and you might want some information, you might, might want some details but it's even more important to get that working together mm -hmm. and, and a sense of understanding each other. Certainly one of the things is you've got to work out what, what is urgent and there are some things that can wait and some things that can't wait. And that whole notion of if, it, if it's a really serious crisis and if the person has already gone through their um, self-soothing and their other um, strategies and it's getting worse and they don't feel safe, you, you've, you've got to know what. Sometimes, sometimes clinicians have to be the person that bears hope on behalf of the client. But sometimes we even may need to, to work out um, how do we handle a, a genuine uh, emergency? Um, but before we get to that, I think it's also really valuable to set aside enough time. And in general practice, historically, that's been um, rather rather difficult. But bit by bit, uh, the way GPs are, are um, set up, the way GPs are funded, um, you know, it is possible to do extra training and get additional Medicare rebate for longer consults. Um, sometimes it may work out that if you've got somebody with BPD, instead of waiting for them to have a crisis and then having to spend 30, 45 minutes with them, it may be more practical to actually say, Let, let's plan that I will see you every fortnight or every three weeks and, and it'll, it'll be for 20 or 30 minutes or maybe even, even longer. Um, certainly we've got to make sure that we're aware of what to do if there is a, a serious emergency and um, Sometimes you even have to think, is, is it time to, to say this person's safety really requires them to be in hospital? I think that's very much a, a last resort and, and uh, you know, something that people uh, appropriately try to avoid. But if you need to do it, you need to know how and your staff need to know what numbers to ring. You need to know where, where are the forms and how. We've lost your sound, Christopher. 
Is that just me or is that red back? No, I can't hear me? either. I can't hear. No, it's dropped out. Yeah. Still talking away, but we we can't hear. Yeah, so. yeah. We'll get red back to have a have a look at that and see what what's happening. Maybe the phone lines dropped out. Okay. Still talking and none of us can hear him. We've got some um, while we're waiting for that to be sorted out. I can let people know that we've got about 1,900 people joining us um, wow. live. So that's, that's, a, that's um, cool. wow. a fabulous number and we, we knew there was a lot of interest, but that's the, that's the number that, um, that people that are out there. So it is important that um, everybody gets to hear what, what Chris has to say and I know he had, had lots of important things that he was, um, he's going to share with us. I have had a, a question around um, clinicians' attitudes and judgments around um, working with people with borderline personality disorder, and I'm hoping that that Chris's introduction there, just talking about the changes in attitudes, um, answers that question. But I guess also the fact that we've got 1,900 people, and many of them will be practitioners, and a panel of people who are committed to doing this work and helping people to understand it and do it better. Hopefully, um, that's kind of covered off on on that question. Um, but if you do have other questions, I am keeping an eye on it. So please, um, please send them through the chance to, um, to give us that, um, that question that you're really wanting to um, talk to us about or make sure that we do, do cover. So Joe, while you're um, waiting there, any reflections on things that Chris was talking about that you um, would like to pick up on? Oh, I was thinking uh, how important all the things he uh, has said ah I think it's yep. I think his his recommendation that rather than wait to a cri till a crisis with these patients it could be very helpful for a general practitioner to see to offer to see the patient every two or three weeks whatever on a regular basis um, because that can often give them somewhere to go if they don't get to crisis point because hopefully they'll feel a sense of connection with their GP. And, and be able to talk to them about whatever's on their mind. I think that's a really excellent suggestion on, yeah. on, on Chris's part. I yeah. don't know how many GPs are able to provide it or offer mm. it, but yep. very helpful, I think. Yeah, yep. okay. Yep. I guess one of the challenges is the, the time that GPs have to be able yeah. to provide that kind of support. But, but I guess yep. for you as... As a psychiatrist as well, knowing that, that the DP is available and you can be working kind of in collaboration together to support the, the patient is, is fantastic. Well, it's great and, when there's a good GP because it makes so much difference to yeah. to our work as a psychiatrist and psychologist. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's of enormous benefit. And sometimes I think another thing is the GP is in... Sometimes for the whole patient, the patient's whole life. You know, mm. they they are the longest. Long term. You know what I mean? The long term yeah, contact sure. and terribly important support people, of course, but not just that. An attachment yep. figure in the bed. Yeah. This is really important. Meaning of yeah. that term. Yeah. Yeah. This relationship. Yeah. All right. We've heard that Red Duck are trying to get back onto Chris, but but not able to. So there's something going on with telephones wherever Chris is tonight. So I think it's because time is really important to us. Let's move on to you now, Jan, and sure. um, that, that you can start yours, and then we'll we'll try and find Chris. He's there somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank uh, thank you, Lynn. Look, uh, firstly, I'm not a clinician, uh, so you need to take my comments as non-clinical. That's a really important thing. I'm also an advocate bringing a um, consumer perspective to the, the webinar this evening. So look, what I'd like to do is to say, well, let's try to touch base with Rachel's feelings. Jo mentioned abandonment, and I think the textbooks say real or imagined, but it's that awful, ever-present internal pain, you know, the, the thing that, that just sticks here in your, in your throat. Um, Rachel was expelled from school. She had a violent episode at home and then her parents refused to uh, let her return. Um, and she lost a significant friend. I mean, think about your own experience when you've lost someone who is perhaps very near or very dear to you. And try and connect with that feeling and, and, uh, and um, try and think about Rachel and others that have BPD 
in terms of the distress and the pain that these feelings bring to Rachel, they're and uh, they probably compare them to yours, and it's probably about ten times more um, uh, uh, serious than than perhaps um, yours. You may think yours is so. You know, it sort of expands enormously. Um, she's overwhelmed by emotion. She says many times that she just wants to to die. Or is it that she just wants that distress to stop? She's, uh, she finds that, as do many people with BPD, very hard to live with that pain. As a teenager, she was unmanageable at home. Now she moves home frequently with frequent ED presentations. She's on and off with friends, too. In other words, she tends to drown them. Her life is in chaos. She's highly anxious. And she needs to be contained, which is the word that Jo used very effectively. So she needs to be contained both within herself and uh, with the help of clinicians. It's that containment, as Jo talked about, that helps with that overwhelming sense. Rachel doesn't feel as though she deserves help. She's very difficult to engage. And she certainly doesn't feel very highly of herself. She certainly doesn't have that, uh, that stable or good self-image that many people with BPD talk about. So in her early years, she disengages with case management. Uh, she has very sporadic attention, uh, attendance to counselling. She's poorly engaged with the case manager and she stays in a violent partnership for three years. She's now looking to move on. And with regard to her sexual assault, she refused to discuss this with the professionals. Um, it's people uh, with BPD often feel just bad about themselves. They are a bad person and they just don't deserve to receive any help or any support. Um, and that is, as we talked about earlier, completely and utterly overwhelming for them. Rachel's coping me mechanisms are uh, cutting. She often takes overdoses and she continues with risky behaviour. Now, this is all part and parcel of her coping mechanisms. I don't believe for one second it's about seeking attention. People don't um, cut or take overdoses on a continual basis and they don't continue with risky behaviour. But certainly in terms of cutting, Many people that I know with BPD who are my friends and my colleagues, they will wear the long sleeves, they will wear the jeans. Um, so I don't believe for one second it's about seeking attention. This is the very thing that people hide, people with BPD hide. Now if we look at, um, at stigma, I think this is a, an area that I would like to speak about. I think it's changing. And I think the fact that you've joined in this webinar um, tonight, just and there's 1,900 or something people on, uh, on this webinar, I just think that that's wonderful. And I do think that uh, that um, cult the culture is changing. Um, that I do think that um, that clinicians are seeing people with BPD and are far more respectful in their um, their association with them. But if we look at stigma. People with BPD have enormous self-shame. Um, as I said, they just feel bad. They feel bad about themselves, bad about everything they do. People with BPD are hardest on themselves. They are their hardest critic. Um, Rachel certainly feels um, she deserves in some way to be treated badly. So when she actually is treated badly, so when she has those verbal put downs and those discriminatory practices shown by some clinicians, she absolutely believes it. You know, she says, "Well, I'm not worthy of this." However, there is absolutely no reason in the world for verbal put downs by health or mental health clinicians or anybody else, people in the community, family, friends. There is absolutely, totally. No uh, requirement, and um, uh, and I think that if you are in a, a culture where there is blame and shame and everything else, then you need to step in and say, you know, this is all about those overwhelming feelings. 
So finally, to the diagnosis itself, we heard Jo talk very clearly about how a diagnosis should be given, and it should be given sensitively. The, the diagnosis itself can certainly be distressing and it can evoke anger. Um, and if it's not done sensitively, it can certainly break down that therapeutic relationship, which is so vital to the clinician um, in the treatment of people with BPD. So um, as Joe said, identify the symptoms um, that, that uh, Rachel or others are feeling, um, and then ask them. Do you think this meets this and this and this? And the answer would probably be yes. Well, then that relates to the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Now, what do you think about that? So getting a diagnosis can be absolutely one of two things. It can be the worst thing ever because people are aware of the consequences of um, what this diagnosis may mean for many in uh, the adult mental health services in Australia. As I said, things are changing, thankfully, but we still have a long way to go. It could also be the absolute best thing for someone with, uh, who is struggling. It can provide a reason for why people are feeling the way they do, and it can provide a reason why people are acting like they do. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> It can be um, an enormous relief to know that you, uh, that you uh, they have um, have a mental illness, and then that explains why the things we, we talked about, the feelings of abandonment and the overwhelming feelings. So there is a great deal of hope. There is a huge amount of hope. There's hope for Rachel. She's now receiving the appropriate treatment and support. She has a consistent GP and. Before we lost Chris, he was talking about um, his relationship with his patients with BPD. Um, very often the GPs are the first port of call in the mental health system, aren't they? They're the source of referral. Um, Rachel has a good psychotherapist. We heard Jo say that psychotherapy really is the best form of treatment for people with BPD. And Rachel's completed the DBT course. Many people who go through the DBT course talk about um, how useful and helpful it's been, but some people um, find a group type setting difficult. Uh, so there needs to be some, some rules and boundaries uh, around that. And some people may need to, to um, go to the DBT course uh, a couple of times if that's possible. Um, but there is a great deal of hope for people with BPD. And I think that therapeutic relationship with you as a clinician, uh, whether you're a psychiatrist, a GP, uh, a psychologist, a mental health nurse, um, and other allied health, uh, if you're a service provider, there's a huge amount of help uh, now for the diagnosis of BPD. So thank you, Lynn, and um, that's all from me. Fantastic. Thanks, Jan. And again, continuing that theme of, of hope, which I think is really important. And I can see from some of the questions coming through that that, this, that people often haven't felt that, that sense of hope or, or um, getting that, that feeling. So I think it's really important for people to hear those messages. So really appreciate that. So thank you. We've got Chris back online now. So let's go back and find Chris. I'm going to whip back to your slides. Julian's waiting very, very patiently. <laughs> and we will get to you, Julian, I promise. <laughs> Now, Chris, it's a bit hard to know exactly when you dropped out, but I think it was when you were talking about this, um, about Rachel and, and this experience of trauma. So I think this slide and the next couple, we'll, we should just do a sure. recap. You were talking beautifully, but we just couldn't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what would we do without technology? Um, <laughs> now, uh, so this, this, this slide's really getting us to think about how to talk about trauma, when to talk about trauma. Uh, I think even Joe would say uh, whether to talk about trauma, and, and certainly it's not what you do in the middle of a crisis. Um, and certainly the GP role, uh, the GP doesn't necessarily, in, in most places, the <coughs> GP doesn't necessarily have to do everything. Um, uh, and, and certainly looking for the underlying trauma is, is um, it's uh, not always important, it's not always helpful. Um, 
and certainly uh, these, these next few points are from a website put together with people from the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists and they say talking about trauma should only happen when you are feeling strong and this is obviously talking to Rachel, when, when Rachel, when you are feeling strong, when you have already started psychological treatment and your problems and symptoms have improved and when you trust your treatment provider and I think that's already been covered but yeah, the whole idea of trying to get to the bottom of the underlying trauma when somebody's in the emergency department or already in an acute uh, inpatient setting, uh, that's probably not the most practical, most logical time to go exploring issues about trauma. And not everyone with BPD has a um, history of trauma, and even those who do, it may not always be the most appropriate or essential starting point. Um, now, um, I have a particular interest in, in the alcohol and other drug area, uh, but I also have a particular interest in how do you get people to talk about what they do, and I, I think it's really important that we normalise it, that we don't sort of ask in a really sort of judgmental, pejorative way, but we, we say, how many days a week do you have alcohol? Uh, and asking questions about um, not just alcohol and other substances, but um, you know, gambling can also be a way people try to let off stress, but it obviously can leave people with more more stress as well. Uh, and another sort of gentle, realistic way of approaching that subject is to say, do you ever have a bet on the horses? Do you play poker machines or buy lottery tickets? Uh, and sometimes you want to know whether people use over-the-counter medications and uh, I guess especially people who might also have concerns about body image and, and their weight, they might be wanting to use diuretics or things like the uh, the old um, tablets used for getting rid of uh, constipation, forward pills and so forth. And the people that have lots of headaches, they'll often end up using codeine and sometimes they'll end up with even more headaches as the codeine wears off. Uh, so lots of things to think about. Um, and in, in the alcohol and other drugs area, sometimes, uh, and seeing as uh, Rachel found she was actually already involved in this um, part of life at the age of 14, sometimes people aren't about to change. And um, then if someone's going to keep using alcohol, it's good to keep them well nourished. It's good to see if we can help them at least get places without being at the wheel of the car. Can we also offer people thiamine to protect them against uh, vitamin deficiency, people who are in, involved with injecting drug use. Um, obviously, if they want to stop, then we offer whatever help to help them um, with a substance-free life, but sometimes people aren't ready to, to give up their use. And then if we can at least talk about clean needle programs, perhaps immunization against hepatitis B, if they've already got hepatitis C, you can treat that quite well now. Some people do very well with um, suboxone or methadone to help overcome the uh, urge to use opiates. Um, and when people are on any other kind of prescription medication, if the person's got a temptation to take a lot of things all at once, another safeguard might be that you don't you don't send them off with a prescription for a month's worth of medication that uh, someone might take all at once. Um, some people, it, it's good to have some uh, reduced intervals and perhaps only collect a supply of a week's worth or even go to the pharmacy every day. Um, naloxone is something that if somebody's had too much opioid, uh, whether it's codeine or morphine or heroin, that gets people back to consciousness and breathing and you still need all the other first aid and things, but that's a, a helpful thing that I think increasingly we'll hear more about in Australia. And another part of sort of general health, uh, you know, when, when, when BPD coexists with um, eating disorders, uh, it's, it's worth just double checking. You know, is, is a, a woman still having her periods? Has her um, diet become so uh, abnormal that we've got to watch out for potassium changes? Uh, got to look at kidney function. So lot, lots of things to keep track of. Uh, but hopefully always bearing in mind uh, respect, support, and, and helping the person get back to their own strength. My last slide's one where, in fact, I'm, I'm not going to talk specifically about therapy, because from some material that uh, uh, people
studied people attending a, um, a UK mental health um, service in the public sector. And ultimately, um, what, what they found was that people attending that service, what they really wanted was help with housing, with their money, with their social networks, and their physical health. They also wanted to come to terms with having a mental illness. Traditionally, professional people are more inclined to focus on treating the mental illness, which obviously is a very good thing too. But if somebody's homeless and they've got psychological symptoms, it may be more practical and more helpful to deal with the homelessness. And once you've shown them that you care about what they think is the most urgent and important thing, uh, that's going to do an awful lot for rapport and therapeutic alliance. I'll stop there and look forward to question and answer, and I hope my technology holds out. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Much better when we can actually hear what you're saying. That was, that was really helpful. And Thanks. I think just looking at the, um, the questions coming through, and there's, there's quite a lot of them, as you would expect, when we've got so many people online. I think some of the things we're touching on in terms of comorbidity and, um, and the complexity, in, in including this last slide, I think... Um, some of that will answer some of those questions, but I think it's very good we've got another, uh, several other webinars coming up because we can pass these questions on and use them because um, it's, it's obviously an area of great interest and, and complexity for people. So hopefully we're answering the questions as we go, but we do know that there are many more. Now we need to move on to you, Julie, and you've been waiting incredibly patiently. It's always a risk of being the last person, <laughs> but we're with you now and looking forward to what you've got to add to the mix tonight. So thanks. Thanks for that, Lena. I'll just skip forward there. Uh, next slide. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so it's important that we think of um, this, this idea of BPD as, as, um, as developmental in origin, but also um, it's important to bear in mind that it is, we can think of it as a relational disorder, and there's a reason for that. Uh, of course, as some of the other speakers have spoken about, there's this notion of a lack of caregiver attunement through no fault of the parents or the family. So this notion of lack of attunement or validation, but we also have uh, histories there, obviously high rates of frank developmental trauma. And we think about this notion of a personality structure, which is inherently uh, developing as unstable. Uh, and many people with BPD will talk about uh, the sense of their mind as being very much locked in emotion and memory. And this notion of repetition uh, in their thoughts and the feeling of uh, uh, the experience of the thoughts racing, not going away, and attempts to control these overwhelming internal states. But we, we, wanna, we want people to really start to think of the, the symptoms of BPD as, as actually adaptive, adaptive to an environment perhaps developmentally, um, often through no fault of the family at all, uh, where the, the child's um, uh, basic needs aren't being met around uh, being seen, being validated, and and um, and being a, sort of having a, a caregiver who is attuned. So we think of these the BPD symptoms in a sense as coming into play uh, for an individual to actually cope in a world where there's a sense of either dangerousness or needs aren't being met. So with a with a sense of an unstable structure. We think of the, the idea of, of an individual like Rachel beginning to look to the environment for stability, an in, in internal sense of instability, looking to the environment for stability, and also hypervigilant to the environment, especially in um, uh, primary relationships, for the signs of danger. And the uh, signs of danger might mean, for example, signs of abandonment, signs that you might be leaving, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we are in relationship with the client, aren't we? So the, the BPD uh, client might come into relationship with us, also with heightened state um, and really looking for the signs of danger, looking for the signs of abandonment. So because we think of this idea of um, BPD or the word of border as perhaps describing the boundary between the self and the other, the system then around the client, the health system, the family and so on, is also affected by the disorder. And, and so uh, we need to take into account the system around the client and therefore any work with Rachel must be absolutely holistic, systemic, but also individual to her. Uh, we, we don't come in with a, 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 a sort of a template for BPD treatment. It is individual to her. 
So we think of the system, the family and the health sector, perhaps at times, especially in cases of moderate to severe BPD, requiring treatment, and that is containment and stabilisation prior to Rachel's treatment. Many people would have seen uh, chaos around clients with BPD, and where that is the case, treatment really, I think as Joe said earlier, treatment really has limited um, uh, facility for success. So we need to look at containment and stabilisation before. We think about systemically collaboration, so Rachel's part of the picture, Rachel's family, etc. Good, effective communication, and the ability to take all perspectives in the system into account because um, people with BPD can often present to different parts of the system in different ways and think of that as context-bound behaviour. Really, once again, it's about getting a needs met. And how do we get needs met? Well, we get needs met in different ways in different environments. So we need to include all perspectives in the system. Uh, we, especially in cases of moderate to, to severe BPD, we really need to think about an inter-service treatment plan, a thoughtful treatment plan, which is inclusive and collaborative with Rachel and her family, and to take what we think of as a, a clinically indicated risk tolerant approach. In terms of uh, the direct treatment for Rachel, and you can see longitudinally, of course, we know the picture, but of course we can imagine that we could enter into treatment with Rachel and, uh, and um, a relationship with Rachel at any point along that picture. So um, we must commence in a sense, because this is, we think about this as a developmental disorder, we think about immediately a developmental assessment. And we use, wherever possible, multiple sources for that assessment. We then develop a thoughtful formulation with ongoing review, and that underpins both the systemic and the individual work. Now that, in a sense, guards against um, short-term reactive type treatments and, and which can often lead to burnout and also lead to unhelpful, um, uh, unhelpful approaches with Rachel and, and uh, the possibility of stigma. Now a focus only on symptom remission. Remember the symptoms are secondary. So if we think only on, on symptom remission, we can actually end up in a kind of, um, uh, in, a, in a pattern of um, uh, treatment that is unhelpful and becomes quite reactive and ineffective. So what we're doing in a sense is we're treating the BCD rather than really just focusing on the symptoms. We need to be non-reactive, we need to think long-term and proactively, and that helps all treatment providers remain thoughtful. And of course, we must keep in mind that this, in a sense, our frontal lobe, our reflective function, is really all we have for the client. So we need to maximise that at all time our ability to remain calm and reflective. So the principles that might underscore the treatment um, for Rachel, uh, we need obviously an ongoing process of understanding. Now we would argue perhaps that even this process of understanding, that is understanding Rachel's lived experience is the treatment. That is an unfolding process without necessarily an answer at the end of the day but an unfolding process of attempting to understand and helping Rachel to also understand her lived experience and of course maintaining a collaborative relationship as its very foundation and a focus on the relationship as we've heard from all the speakers tonight. Autonomy for change, we tend to take up responsibility for change uh, for clients with BPD, but we need gentle and continual returning to Rachel uh, around her autonomy for change. What is it that she wants? How can she get there and so on? Um, because we think about this notion of attachment trauma, et cetera, uh, we, and, and that often the body is used in particular ways to, uh, as a, as a, as in terms of the symptoms and so on, there's a focus on putting words to internal experiences and the use of language rather than acts on the body and otherwise. And over time, what we see as the client um, develops the language for their own experience, we see a softening and decreasing of the severity of the symptoms. Now with Rachel, we know that she's had an eating disorder in the past and she's experienced trauma, some frank trauma, so we need to check carefully for the symptoms of PTSD, but also the, um, the possibility of obsessiveness in, in this client group, which, and the rates of that are quite high. Now it's important always to keep in mind family. Uh, Rachel has a family. She, her family are very important to her. 
and and having worked a lot with families, I'm aware that parents can experience considerable blame and stigma in the health systems around BPD. And of course, providing that there is no kind of frank perversity in the family, the parents can offer us um, a great deal of expertise and developmental picture that we wouldn't perhaps otherwise know and a, a very important perspective. They're going to be around long after where we've left the scene. So it's important that we include them and we collaborate with the family, of course, with Rachel's permission. Working with Rachel's family and parents separately is going to be very important to support them and to support them to understand the kind of principles that the treatment, that underpins the treatment, um, so that they can then collaborate and be part of the, uh, of the team as well. The parents are likely to experience a great deal of guilt, anxiety and anger and frustration and along with profound feelings of grief that can be associated with the loss of the daughter that they hoped for, the life that they wished for for their daughter, but also the loss of the life that they might ex uh, experience as well. Parents can be highly traumatised and, um, and quite hypervigilant to risk as well. The parents' input can greatly assist our work as they begin to collaborate, and we've seen this many, many times with families that can work wonderfully. Lastly, uh, it's important to be able to look after yourself because really you need to attend to your work and you need to be uh, the best possible clinician you can be for your client. And we're exposed to a great deal of raw emotions and uh, raw materials, uh, often related to trauma, and it can take its toll. We have, all we have for our clients, as, as I said earlier, is our ability to reflect. And when we're stretched, when we're anxious, when we're reactive, when we're burning out, this function can absolutely be compromised. So it's important that we process that raw material outside of the session and then we can come in with the client, with the client in session in a thoughtful way and be as therapeutic as we possibly can. We always get caught in enactments with this client group. Um, we can't avoid it in a sense, so it's important that we also have space and time to process that. We must be aware of the, our own limits, that is our own personal limits and attend to that, and the limits of our role and remain within our role to prevent um, overreach and burnout. Of course, lastly, work structures that, are, that support a thoughtful engagement with this client group are absolutely critical. And we would argue that advocacy for this in the workplace where you see some unhelpful structures that actually work against um, the best possible treatment for people with BPD is also advocating for the client group. So we would support people to absolutely advocate for better structures in the workplace to support their, their best practice with BPD. So thanks for your time. Fantastic. Thank you for your time, Julian. <laughs> A lot of information there. And it felt like at any one of those points we could continue the conversation. But I, I do think a lot of the questions I've been looking at were about family, were about particularly around supervision and support and, and the links, I guess, when people and young practitioners coming through and negative attitudes sometimes and people having to provide support. So hopefully people are seeing their answers in, in your slides and, and the other slides. So, th so thank you very much and it does highlight that there's much more we could be talking about. We are running out of time though and normally we would be moving on to the Q&A and I did say we'd get there but um, because our presentations have been so extensive and because we, we took a little bit of time um, finding Chris when he disappeared on us, I think we need to move pretty quickly into our um, more kind of reflective passing comments really or take home messages. Um, I did say, so I'll get the panellists just to think about what your, your take home message is because that's, that's what we're going to be um, doing now but just so that people are aware I did talk earlier about the resources and further information and I think that is important because it's a while before the next webinars come next year. But no, they will come and these questions will all be forwarded on in, and really help with the planning of those webinars. But there's a range of resources available um, on this link. The slides are available for you. So there's a folder that you should be able to access now that, that do have the slides. So you should be able to access those. But I do want to hear from each of the panellists just with your, your kind of takeaway message and, and you might have planned it beforehand or there might have been something that's come to you that you really thought you'd get to answer in the question and answer. So maybe it's one of those answers without the question. Who'd like to go first? We'll go back to you, Jo. Oh dear. I was just thinking what on earth will I say. Um, <laughs> I, I think, um, I guess what I want to say is that when I first uh, graduated as a psychiatrist in 1983, um, 
I was told, oh no, we, we don't treat people with BPD, it's, uh, it's untreatable. And what I want to say is that in the last, well, however many years there is since 1983, things have changed totally and dramatically. It is an eminently treatable illness. There is no question that it must be treated. These people need treatment and they re respond extremely well to effective treatment for BPD. Uh, always, always keep on um, looking for that connection with someone, a, a clinician, a GP, a psychiatrist or psychologist that you feel safe in um, because and, and, and make the commitment to work with that person through all the ups and downs that really are quite inevitable because you'll get better. You'll get better if you do that. And uh, so that's really what I want to say. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you for your, your time tonight. Let's move on to you, Chris. Have you got a take-home message for us? Yeah, I, I think in addition to Joe's ho whole message of hope, I think there is also hope in that there are more and more places. Uh, that there was a time, uh, perhaps a, a person that I've worked with for a number of years who, who was in a fairly bad way in the beginning. He's given me permission to talk about him and... Um, he came to me when he was referred by the court diversion program and he was harming himself but really getting into trouble with other people in the community and um, partly after a, a local community mental health team said, oh no, you're not, you're not suitable, um, then he wound up, wound up admitted to hospital and um, when he uh, had a bit of attention during that inpatient stay, um, it was possible to help get through the um, alcohol withdrawal to get on some treatment for uh, some substance use. And later on, he did get into a um, DBT group and he's flourished. And he's just one of many people I've seen do remarkably well. So keep on keeping on. Thanks. Okay, another good message. And I guess for, for people who are who are listening tonight, to be able to go away with some of these ideas. And so if they're hearing attitudes that are not, so current and consistent with what we're talking about, to be able to challenge them and refer them on to this to this webinar and to the rest of the series would be a great great way of continuing to challenge, I guess, some of those outdated ideas and, and the stigma that that we still um, it takes a long time to change. I guess. Dan, let's hear from you. Have you got a take home message for us? Yes, uh, Lynn, I've got a couple. Um, anger. Uh, if that's shown to you, it's not personal. Just remember that uh, and just be aware of that internal pain that people are, are suffering and are feeling very, um, very much. Um, and just remember that people do recover and as clinicians you have a real part to play in this. And what a rewarding journey for you. People with BPD really are worth um, investing your time and your energy. And um, BPD is now seen as a legitimate mental illness and it's certainly a legitimate use of mental health dollars. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, thanks, Dan. And it's been great to have your voice because I know when we, when we do webinars and, and other activities, we don't always have the voice of, a, of an advocate. So I think that's really given us a, another perspective and really appreciated that tonight. So thank you. Pleasure. And back to you, Julian. Last again. <laughs> But not least at all. So what's your final... You get the final say. That's a good thing. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, look, I, I think it's important for people to keep in mind that the treatment for BPD is actually in some ways um, counterintuitive. The treatment as usual, the kind of normal medicalised or recovery models really don't work so well. Um, and, and so what we tend to do because we're, we're presented with someone with a great deal of suffering and very compelling symptoms, we tend to jump in very, very quickly and get very active and attempt to get rid of the symptoms. And we want you to really think about coming back to this notion of attempting to understand the person's experience, remaining calm and collaborative. So, um, so in, and when that occurs, when we be, begin to actually work in a different way with CPD, we're actually working um, in a way that can be enjoyable, be interesting, and, and your client will start to get better. And, and I think that's a, a very important message 
that um, people with BPD get better when they, they're actually engaged in the right treatment, in an evidence-based treatment. It's very, very important. And if you feel like you've, um, you've got clients with BPD and you're really struggling in the work, it's important to go and get supervision and training so that you've got a treatment that you can actually offer people with BPD. Yep, great, thank you. And again, why we need some more webinars to, to explore that further so that people are really, I guess, using that as their, their training and, and support and, and looking at this in more detail. So hopefully tonight has given you a really good overview of what it is that we're talking about and some challenges to, to the way we might think about it. And I think there's a lot of information that people will, will certainly take for tonight. We do want people's feedback. And so there should be a survey that's coming up on your screen now. And we would like you to um, fill that out. It's always important for us. And also with government funding, we, we have accountabilities and we need to report back. But we all always want the feedback and want to hear what you think and what's been helpful and what, what else we could do to improve, particularly when we do have these other webinars coming up. While you're doing that, though, it's important that you also know that there are practitioner network opportunities that are set up by MHPN. And there's the website there that you can join a local practitioner network. And there are um, forums that are being established for practitioners who have a shared interest in BPD. So again, another avenue to get some additional support from, from other colleagues who are interested in, in BPD and are really wanting to um, learn together and continue, continue the learning. So there's an opportunity there to, to contact MHPN to, to find out more and, and um, put your name there. So thank you everyone for your participation and we're really pleased that um, we've had such fabulous numbers. It's a lot of people who are joining us. We've had a panel that you can see have, have given us an enormous amount of information and shared a lot of their, their expertise and experience. We've really enjoyed that. You will get a certificate for um, the webinar, a certificate of attendance within the next four weeks. You'll also receive a link to the online resources that come with this webinar within the next two weeks. And please look out for the next webinar in the series, which will be held in early 2018. So we're really hoping that you can, you can join us then and, and continue um, this Series and, and have some of those many questions answered in, in follow-up webinars. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to the panellists again for your contribution and everybody else at home who's been participating and sending the questions and, and they will be answered in, in other, other webinars. So good evening, everyone.